Welcome, movie fans, to a brand new episode of Hollow Victories, where your biggest fuck-ups can also be a success. I am your host, Matt Presents, joined, as always, by my devilish co-host. Hello, my name is Hex Rider. We have a, a very, very special guest of us today, returning. Hey, it's me, I'm Olivia, the archivist, riding in for another episode of Hollow Victories. What's up? See, that was a lot yes. better than whatever me and you came up with, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Simple and to the point. It's a, it's a, yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome back, Olivia. Thank you for Thanks coming Thanks for having back. me. We, I, I always intended you for you to be on, like, when we talked about, like, obscure comic characters, because you, you know your comic books way better than we do. Um <laughs> But Guilty. but you also said you liked Phantom Menace, so it's like ah, uh, we should have her on to talk about Phantom Menace. Of course, how often are you going to find someone else who likes Phantom <laughs> Menace? <laughs> it has its defenders. Yeah, I pro- right now it probably has. Hmm, I don't know how true that is. Like, I was going to say it has more defenders than the sequel trilogy, but that might just be. be- I might only be saying that because of no. fucking YouTube. No, I I don't think that's the case. Yeah, I think it's just, Uh, like, I I was so exposed to YouTube videos talking about their hatred for the sequels. I I feel like we've reached the point where, like, people who who would come around on the prequels have already come around on them. Because when they came out, I think pretty much everyone kind of liked them right out the gate. And very slowly we were all like, wait a minute, this is not very good. And it hit this point of, like, extreme hatred for the prequels. And some people have come out on the other side like, nah, these weren't as bad as people say they are. I think also you have to compare it to what we got. Like, once we started getting the sequel sequels, like 7, 8, and 9, people were like, oh, man, you know, what's going on with Star (laughs) Wars? I do think there are some people who are, like, trying to defend the prequels just because they fucking hate the sequels. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. I I don't know how fair that is. Yeah, I think... Um, I think a lot of it just comes down to, like, culture nowadays, too. Because, like, things with the internet and everything, it's a lot different than it was when the prequels came out. Like, I mean, just, like, the main... I'm not saying this is the only reason people dislike the sequel series, by the way, but just the main character being a female is going to get a lot of YouTubers riled up. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Well, sequels in general do. Yeah. And Star Wars does. But, uh... Speaking of movies that you have admitted to liking you you do have a bit of a tie to today's matchup because you said you liked the first ghost rider i do i consider it to be a great filming like i can't even call it a guilty pleasure i just straight up enjoy that movie unironically (laughs) i i wish i knew why (laughs) and, and and today we have a matchup it's like weirdly specific two movies a year apart from each other both comic book characters who have, like, supernatural sort of satanic powers, and both of them involve, uh, both of them have the involvement of uh, Neville Dean and Taylor, the pair behind the Crank duology. Uh, one of them was written by them, the other was directed by them. I'm talking, of course about 2011's Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance versus 2010's Jonah Hex. Um, and if you guys don't have any further comments, I'll jump right into uh, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. Let's do it. I am ready. All right. So Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance is the second film in which Nicolas Cage plays the Ghost Rider. That said, it's not much of a sequel. It it contradicts some of the lore of the first one. Satan is played by a different actor. Granted, in this one, they say Satan takes, like, many different forms, so you could kind of take it as, like... You, you could take this as a sequel to the first film, or you could take this as, like, a separate canon where the Ghost Rider is still being played by Nicolas Cage. Uh, either way, within the film, Mr. Johnny Blaze, who is also the Ghost Rider, of course, uh, is contacted to track down this child who's 
like the son of Satan and Satan has Satan who has taken the form of a of a human of a man has plans to transfer himself into the body of a younger child as the body he's in is growing old and decrepit he he wants to like move on to a a, a new body and and so it's it's up to Mr. Johnny Blaze the ghostwriter to get this child before you know Satan gets him before Satan can transfer into the new body because the the implication is that that would somehow bring about the end of the world that Satan would then have the power to to end the world yeah from uh, what they via, via this new body no yeah from what they say in the movie I guess since the kid is half human he can exist in the mortal world and use all of his satanic powers without decaying so that's the that's the reason why he wants to do the soul transference. Mm hmm. Um. O other deviations from the previous film. In the previous film, Johnny Blaze had a love interest played by Mrs. Eva Longoria. She is not in this sequel. He has a new love interest in this one, kinda. Uh, they don't lean into it that much. They definitely lean into him being, like, a father figure for this, like, Antichrist kid a lot more than they do, like, the love interest. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Olivia, you're our guest. What did you think of this film? I gotta say, this was... Yes, it's, like... Like, this is... It was fun. I gotta say, I had a... I actually had a lot of fun watching that. I think that, um... It's just so, like the first one, the draw of it, it's so over, you know, it's over the top. It's kind of, you know, they just go really hard with the action and stuff. But this one, it just somehow finds a way to go harder. And it feels like <laughs> someone really just let Nick Cage go run wild, which is, I think, the one of the biggest draws to this movie. <laughs> oh, this, this has some of the most insane Nick Cage acting of any movie he's in. And that's like saying For a lot. Sure. <laughs> I got it. I got to say actually it's really funny as someone and this is like something I've kind of noticed between both these movies and I might I might talk I don't I don't know if I'm going to talk about it later so I'm going to talk about it now. They're act the I don't know if it's Neville Dean and Taylor specifically but somebody on both of these movies is actually paying attention to the comics. Which is really, really messes with me because, yeah, the whole thing about, like, the corrupted angel and Xanathos, that's a whole thing in the comics. That's, like, actually mm. a thing. And it had just, I think it had already come to pass in the Ghost Rider comics before this these movies were made. But that was a whole thing that for some reason someone went, oh, yeah, we're bringing that in. And then... Even the point, like, I kind of was wondering, I haven't seen this movie, I was wondering, the kid's name is Danny, and that's the name also of the second Ghost Rider. Mm. So the whole time I was sitting there like, are, are they going to do it? Like, is that, are we doing the thing? You know, like, is this going to, is this kid going to, are they going to imply this kid's going to grow up and be Ghost Rider? Are they going to, get they obviously they didn't, but it was, I was sitting there like, okay, someone did their homework at least. The second Ghost Rider in the comics, at least, right? Because like, yeah, if I recall from the first film, there were Ghost Riders before Johnny Blaze. Yeah, um, no, yeah, that's Sam Elliott in the first film as the previous Ghost Rider. Yeah, no, yeah. So in the in the yeah, you're right. In the in the comics, yeah, da uh, Danny was the name of the second Ghost Rider after Johnny Blaze. Not if forever, but yeah, yeah. That the that the comics followed. Yeah. Michael, what'd you think? Um, I think that the dialogue and acting was really, really, really bad. Like, <laughs> potentially some of the worst that we've covered on the show. But Nick Cage is so much fun in this movie with his acting. Like, it's bad acting. It's not, you know, we, <laughs> tying it back to that community episode where they're trying to figure out what's a good 
if Nicolas Cage is a good actor or bad actor, this would definitely be used in the category of bad actor. But it's still really entertaining. He's still the most... In- he, he gets your attention, even when he's just delivering really bland lines. It's just, there's something to his voice with it. Like, there's something, the way he's delivering it, where even if he sounds disinterested in the movie that he's currently in, he still just delivers it in kind of a goofy way. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, you could almost you could cast him in a Wes Anderson movie where he's just set going through like serious <laughs> shit very casually. Um, I think what helps the movie a lot is again Nick Cage, but also I not only think the action scenes are a lot of fun and a lot of like the movie's just really goofy in a fun way, but genuinely pretty well made for the most part. There are scenes where I don't feel that way. But, I mean, there are action scenes that I thought were, like, well shot. I think that there's effects that look good under the right circumstances. We'll get to that. Um, I, I think it's a, like, decently well-made movie. And, you know, we have these two directors. You showed me the two crank movies before that. I Yeah, I, I believe the people who made this movie are two passionate people who were handed a stupid fucking script. And they tried <laughs> their best to make it work. But to give uh, what Olivia said some credit, like, yeah, I mean... Honest to God, I don't even think it's the story that's the problem or the connections they're making to the comic that are the problem. I think it's the dialogue. The dialogue is as as fucking basic as you can get. It's just I, I every single line in this movie is in a different movie. <laughs> no, yeah, you really oh, could yeah. play like movie line bingo with this, you know? Yeah, like it's for just sure. it's that tropey. <laughs> Actually, it's really funny. When we were looking at the credits in the movie, um, one of the guys who wrote the screenplay was David S. Goyer, and he went on to go write The Dark Knight, I'm assuming, not that Uh, long after this. (laughs) No, he he wrote The Dark Knight before this. This was 2010. Dark Knight was 08. Yeah. Was it really? Um, Oh, my God. David S. Goyer is a weird one, because he wrote The Dark Knight trilogy, and he wrote... The Blade trilogy and like the yeah. first two Dark Knight and the first two Blade movies are like great, but he's also on like so much crap, and you're like, yes. <laughs> is is he a good writer? I is it can't possible tell. that he just loses? Is it possible that he just loses interest after a while? Like maybe he didn't really want to do a third Dark Knight, but he kind of was obligated to, so he half assed it. Yeah, I mean. I mean, to be fair, both of those trilogies have disappointing third entries. Blade, I would say, much true. more than The Dark Knight, even though I do not like Dark Knight Rises. I agree. Uh, I, I will back you up on that, Matt. Yeah, I didn't but really he, like Dark he Knight also, Rises either. He was also a writer on Man of Steel and uh, Dawn of Justice, neither of which I thought were very good. And on this, which I did not think was very good. <laughs> I think the writing's the worst part of this movie. Um, I think that, again, plot-wise, this story could work. You know, I mean, it's nothing special, but, you know, if the dialogue was better, I think I'd be fine with it. It leaves enough opportunities for, like, you know, villains and, um, you know, some cool... It has a lot of, like, setups to nice action scenes. Like, it's doing what an action movie needs to do. Um, but yeah. it's just, I, there's nothing really about the story that I think is that outlandish, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, like yeah. bad or good, but with the dialogue, it's like so bad, but it's also sometimes so bad. It's good. I think the only thing in the story that's kind of poorly done is Idris Elbus's inclusion where he is in the opening scene and then fucks off until the very end of the movie where it's like if he was a character in the first movie I could give that some I could give that a pass it's like okay there is he's already established so he really only needs to like be in this opening scene to give the mission and then show up at the end but no he I asked I asked you guys that and apparently he's you know just come like this is his first movie in the series so it's like why why yeah, did no, they the- do that shouldn't he be in more of the movie if he's this important of a character yeah, yeah, I also, I think that's kind of fully epitomized in, like, the scene when um, Idris Elba's character reunites with, um, he reunites with everybody, and he looks at the, he looks at Nadia, the woman, and he goes, hey, Nadia, glad you're not shooting at me this time, ha ha, and they all kind of just, like, laugh, and she, like, I see, you see her, like, she pretends to shoot him with her, 
with your fingers like, right. like oh yeah i totally knew that we have we now suddenly all have this chemistry and we're all good now and we all have hit that, whole that was like uh, such a long time ago we we're, we all have all this history now and we're not that it's but we can laugh about it now because so much time has passed like, this is the second time you're seeing her <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, and she fully did not trust you when you showed up the first time. That you guys are not cool, <laughs> and like you know, I could maybe understand Johnny and Moreau because they're like, they kind of have this whole thing of where like Johnny's depending on him to possibly remove the Ghost Rider curse, and Moreau just seems like is just kind of seems like one of those people who's just gonna barrel ahead and be like, yeah, we're doing the thing, you know. But it's like. It's such a weird balance because, yeah, and then because all the character interactions feel rushed, like Nadia trusting Johnny Blaze feels rushed. Everyone trusting Moreau feels rushed. Danny wanting to basically adopt Johnny <laughs> feels rushed. Right. Yeah. And, uh, uh, real, real quick, just before we're off topic. Um. And then say what you got to say, Matt. I, I will say, though, I do kind of... I understand what you're saying about Nick Cage's character and Andrew Zelbus' character, because I am not going to remember their names. I'm sorry. Um, no matter how many times you say them. But, like, I, I, I do hear what you're saying with that, because, like, yeah, he does have, like, more of a reason to want to be around this guy. But at the same time, they have the opening scene, and then there's one scene of him mentioning him where he calls him a dick. And then this they, sh- and then when they show back up, it's like they've been friends their entire lives. Like it doesn't work. No, yeah, definitely. Go ahead, I was Matt. gonna say like during the movie, you compared Johnny and Danny's relationship to like uh, Kevin Costner and the Girl in Waterworld, <laughs> and I think that's unfair. I think they do give I, I think that's like the one developed relationship in the movie is johnny and danny <laughs> i don't know I, I think that it's better in this movie than Waterworld because um he didn't try to kill danny like seven times before they have the bond and scene but i think there's like an equal number of bond and se- bond and scenes between them as there is in Waterworld. In fact, I think in Waterworld, Kevin Costner spends some more time with them, but again, he's just being a fucking asshole through a majority of that. I will, but like, yeah, I it's will. like it's like the piston scene, and then the motorcycle scene, which are like you know back to back, and then the, that's really it. There's also the diner scene, I guess, where like, but it's like still, it's so awkward, like you know, yeah, yeah. No, the, 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 there's the awkward, like, okay, we're, 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 got, we gotta work together, me and this kid, and then moving forward, I, I, I kinda, I think they work together, more no. or less. I mean, the, they work together better than any other relationship in the movie, that's what I'll say. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll agree with that it's better than that movie, but I, I still stand by my comparison, I don't. I think that's, to be fair, I think that's the case of most movies like this. Like, there's a child that's important for whatever reason, and the main character has to bond with them. I think that's done yeah. well so rarely. Like, Sixth Sense, it's done well in Sixth Sense. Uh, looking for a second I, example, let's name one. Does anyone have I've one? I've heard, heard um, Leon. Leon I've the heard, Professional was what I yeah. was going to say. I've heard that one is a good example of it. Yeah, I, I think like as far as like action movies where like the action hero has to bond with a child, yeah, Leon the Professional, good example of that. May may maybe too good in <laughs> like like there there are people who feel like it's bordering on romance in that movie, and it's like okay, hold on, wait, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you no, maybe, no, no, maybe no, no, not no. that far. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, is that like a s- sincere opinion or is that just people being goofballs online? I think that's people projecting it's because not, it's a small Natalie Portman, but which does not make it better. It's but. not unfounded. I don't think it's unfounded. I don't think that's what the movie is going for, but I also don't think it's unfounded. Okay. Uh, I will say... Of of Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, just to give sort of broad thoughts here, I do have a bit of a hard time deciding which Ghost Rider movie I think is better, because the first one is, like, so boring and generic, and the second one is not that at all, 
but it can be very obnoxious sometimes. I've softened on the editing a little since I saw it in high school. I, I really fucking hated this movie, and especially the editing when I was in high school. I've softened on it a little, possibly just because I'm more familiar with the Crank movies now. I was gonna like, say... They, they do go for that Crank style. I don't think it works in this movie the way it does in the crank duology but you know it's 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 not unbearable it's not as unbearable as i thought it was i think the thing is is like again it goes with what i'm saying i think it's a movie that's made by competent filmmakers but it's also a movie where a lot's working against them uh, now, again, as th that doesn't mean that they're completely free of criticism no like they as directors you need to pick a style that works for your movie. But I will say, like, it's nice that the shots and edit in this movie have that level of effort to them. They are trying throughout the whole thing. But you are correct. A lot of the edit in decisions in this movie are also edit in, edit in decisions in Crank that have purpose in Crank, where in this movie it's just, oh, that's just what we do, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, like, Crank, Crank is this very chaotic, disorienting movie... And so when you have these, like, chaotic, disorienting edits in there, it just sort of adds to the style of the film. Right. This movie is a little more grounded, a little more straightforward, and so when you get those moments in this, you're like, whoa, hold on, whoa. Like, the fucking... And so, some of them are so fucking stupid. The goddamn Jerry Springer joke in this movie... <laughs> he's like oh the devil could be anyone and then just just jerry springer pops that up was screen. yeah and he's, it's not even in this like they have these like stylized drawings leading up to that and then it's just a png of jerry springer that's like a fucking south park joke and it would make you laugh on south park but in ghost rider it's fucking weird and out of place <laughs> It's very weird, which it, I will have, it got me to laugh, but it was because I was so like, okay, what just happened? What? It right. felt like, it felt like, honestly, like whoever, cause it's like, it felt like someone had edited it out. Like the real clip of the, from the movie should be something else, but someone messed with it and put something else there, you know? But I, I wish, I wish that was true, but I don't think it is. I think that's real. I, I think don't. that was in the movie. I don't think the movie is self-aware at the right points a lot of the time. Yeah. If it was a way, like, I think that's one of the issues with this, with this movie is it's not as self-aware as it should be. But sometimes when it does have self-awareness, like, yeah, it's coming in at the wrong point. Like, that was a very weird joke to throw into a movie like this. And a lot of the times I appreciate that. I appreciate a movie, like, allowing itself to do a weird edit like that. Like, it's almost treating itself more like it's a fucking YouTube video than a movie but it has to fit the tone and i don't know like it it doesn't it, it, it with how seriously this movie has taken itself a lot of the time it felt very weird when they did stuff like that they did quite a few edits like that in this movie they did yeah 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 like crank is a much funnier movie than this so when they do comedic stuff like that it works and they didn't do this anything movie, that blatant this this movie it's like, it's not a funny movie, really. Occasionally, you'll get something funny in there. I think, like, the pissing flamethrower scene kind of works. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Like, Even here's the thing. That, that is something I chafed against in high school, but now I'm like, nah, that's funny. <laughs> no, I can't. Like, here's the thing. Like, if, because they have a very similar scene. Not exactly. Well, um, they have a pissing scene in the first Transformers movie. And that killed that movie for me <laughs> with fucking Bumblebee. Okay. You know, but no, that killed it for me. But for some, but on the flip side for this, I kind of forgive this movie. I don't, I'm not giving this movie a pass for it, but I will admit it was funny. You know, the fact that they also committed and brought it back as like a thing. Right. At the like end, that, yeah. I was going to say, okay. You know, the fact that they, like, I kind of respected them a little bit for committing to the bit, not just making it this weird one-off joke. It's still dumb. It's still <laughs> stupid. There are definitely 
moments in this movie where you can feel, like, the cultural influence of Transformers. There are some Transformer-ass sound effects in this movie. Oh, yeah. Like, you, you can tell that those were popular when this movie was made. Not to mention, like, just... It's a, I, I'm going, I, I'm going to blame Transformers for this. I'm probably wrong, but how explodey <laughs> everything is, <laughs> okay, you know? Okay, the, the scene where he, like, takes over a fucking, like, giant saw crane. Oh, I will never complain about that scene. That's kind of awesome. That, that was that was right. That that that's seems a, great. That's a good scene. <laughs> that was cool. Oh, can I say something about the effects in this movie? Because I, I I was saying this when we were watching it, and it's something I feel very passionate about. Talk about the effects. I think in a lot of films, I've seen a lot of movies will use um, it being dark as a way to hide the imperfection in special effects. And I have criticized that in the past, but I criticize that when it's so dark that you literally can't see anything. I'm talking about that fucking Godzilla movie like where they Jonah fight. Hex. Are you Jonah yeah. Hex. Yeah, sure. Jonah Hex. Like yeah. that, God, that Godzilla King of Monsters movie was a huge example of that. Cause I was actually looking forward to watching that with my friend. Cause I saw Kong Skull Island and I thought that movie looked really good. And, but they hid all of the fights with like the light, like the darkness, and you could only see something when lightning struck. Like I thought that was so lame. I was so disappointed by that movie. But um, I wasn't that disappointed. I'm not like a big enough monster movie fan to get that disappointed. But I was bored, and I didn't want to be. Um, this movie, I think the nighttime scenes work really great because it's not so dark that you can't see anything. In fact, the flames make it very bright. But the darkness around it makes the flames blend in really nicely. The final scene, for whatever reason, it's daytime. And it didn't have to be. It's nighttime when the scene starts. And then it just randomly becomes fucking daytime. So yeah, that was so it ruins weird. the scene. All of the effects look like shit when it's in daytime. I thought it looked terrible in that final scene. Um, I, I had it like ranked pretty highly on my Hollow Victories list on Letterboxd. And... I put that back like four spots because of that scene. That was like the climactic <laughs> scene of the movie. And I thought, if you guys disagree with me, please, if I'm being too harsh, please call me out here. I thought that last scene looked terrible. The only shot I, I liked was when he sends him to hell. That, that Like when he sends the main villain to hell. That, I liked that shot a lot. That was funny. I I don't think it looks... I, I don't think it's like the biggest drop in quality, but it definitely looks a lot worse in the light than it did in the dark. I agree, it looks good when it's in the dark. Yeah. Which is most of the movie. Yeah. It's funny when we started with it started out like that first fight scene when Ghost Rider first appears, like I actually had a lot of respect for that scene. Like when you see like yeah. literally when you can see on his shoulder the leather in his jacket is bubbling as it's like peeling from the heat of the skull, you know? Yeah, and I was like, "Whoa, holy shit!" They paid attention to that. That's awesome. And then by the end, I was like, "Oh, okay, here we are." And it wasn't like it wasn't a huge drop in quality, but for me, but I thought, but it's like, but yeah, it did go down a bit in being in the light. You know, it just lost a lot of that drama. You know, my issue with that final scene was it was where I could tell where the effects started and where the live action shot started. You know. I could see the yeah. fucking line on every single flame. Um and yeah, I I did I yeah, I, I thought it looked really bad. Maybe I'm being dramatic, but it's it's better effects than the first Ghost Rider. <laughs> yeah, but they committed to shooting everything of his in the dark, I think, if I remember right. <laughs> I don't remember for sure. Right Why now. would you want your final fight scene to take place during the daytime too? Isn't nighttime like a better like setting yeah, for Ghost no, Rider. Yeah, no, that the whole climax I think would have played better at night. Yeah, well, because they made a big deal about it. They're like, oh, he has to do the ritual before daybreak, you know. So wouldn't it have been like a literal? They could have made it a literal race against time with the sun coming up and then being like, oh shit, we gotta, you know, yeah. we gotta stop them. Yeah, it would have. It would have. bet this movie has no pacing, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> Do we want to talk about casting at all, or is there anything else we want to say about the film visually? Uh, I don't know that I have anything else. 
I'm ready to move on to casting. Because we do oh, have yeah. a pretty interesting cast with this one. We Bef- really do. Before we talk about any of them, can I just mention one of the actors who I think kind of has a sad but funny story here? Sure. Yes. Fergus R- Riordan as Danny. I might be saying butchering his last name. But he, uh, I looked him up to see if he was in anything. I think Ghost Rider may have killed his career because he has this list of filmography in 2011 is Ghost Rider. And pretty much after 2011, he doesn't work anymore. Except for a 2015 movie titled Don't Grow Up. Damn, that's dark. <laughs> those, I, I, yeah, I don't, because it's one of those things that I know child actors get a lot of flack, but I thought Danny, like, Danny was pretty solid. Granted, he wasn't given a ton to do in this movie. I thought Danny he was, was fine. pretty good, but he, yeah, he, he was is, fine. He is older than most, like, bad well, child yeah. actors we talk about, I think. Yeah, no, for sure. Because they make a point of pointing out he's supposed to be, like, 13, so we can assume he's somewhere in that age range. And, yeah, he's got it. should, you know, there's a lot of, like, really talented young actors who got their start around that age or who have been in stuff, and they're really good, you know? That's, like, a good age, right. you know, where, where people shouldn't be judging them that hard. I, but, I, I, you know. I think any time you see a bad child performance in a movie, it's on the director, it's not on the kid. But, um... yeah. Because, like, if a kid, <laughs> I think if you cast a kid, even though you know they're not a good actor, you're, you are leading that kid down a dark path. Yeah, um, you're the idiot. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I, honest to God, like, I'm not even saying that to insult him as an actor. I'm just saying that to say, like, yeah, this movie may have not been a good thing for him because I thought, yeah, I thought he was decent. Um, you know, not, not like, I'm not going to praise the performance or anything, but I mean, for, yeah, for a younger performance, like, there was nothing blatantly wrong with it. Nicolas Cage, like, you know, the b- big guy in this movie definitely had a way goofier presence. Oh, for sure. I suppose we've, we've more or less talked about Nicolas Cage in this movie, haven't we? Yeah. Second time appearing on Hollywood Vectors, if we haven't mentioned that already. Yes. <laughs> After after Left Behind. I'm sure it won't be his last. Yeah. I I think Nick Cage has a lot of potential to return. Yeah. Um the love interest v- Violente Placido is her name. I have not seen her in anything else. I was um, not wowed by her. She definitely wasn't like I think, like, Johnny Whitworth was a lot worse, or, like, a lot of the villains were a lot worse I, than her, but... Yeah, no, she's... She's not given a lot. Yeah. No, yeah, I don't think she's... Even, I don't think she's like, getting a Razzie, but she's definitely not getting anything else, you know? Yeah. She's not getting... You know, she's not... Yeah, she's yeah, just, d- d- despite how much of the movie she's in, she is really not given a whole lot to work with. yeah. I mean, I think she is just there to be the character that the main character is in love with. Like, I think that the fact that they wrote off the first the first movie's love interest like it was nothing shows where their priorities are with that. They're not really interested in writing a good romantic partner for the character, even if like, again, romance was definitely less of this character. I definitely don't. I don't even think other action movies, but. I don't even think she was meant to be a romantic interest, you know, like there's if there if she was, then, yeah, that just shows that they did it really badly. But I think she's only there. I think she's only there to be like the party that acts on behalf of Danny since Danny's in so little of this movie, you know? Mm. Yeah. Because if they were trying to put them, put her in her in Nick Cage's, you know, if they were trying to put them together, there was nothing. Yeah, no, I I feel like there is not a lot of chemistry. I I feel like there was more chemistry between him and Eva Longoria in the first film. Uh, even well, there was supposed to even, be there. Even if you know she she doesn't, they 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 do this very common action trope, which is to just f- completely forget about the love interest from the first movie. And I mean, that does tie into, like, what I was saying about, like, this could be taken as a sequel or it could be taken as, like, its own continuity. 
because, uh, I mean, on top of that, you have, uh, Sirion Hinds, I believe is how you pronounce that. I might have mispronounced that. He plays the devil in this where, uh, it was Peter Fonda in the first movie, which is, like, very funny casting since, like, you know, Ghost Rider, he's a biker, Peter Fonda was in the biker movie Easy Rider, He's he's a very good choice for the devil, I think. I I think he played a good devil, despite my my distaste for the first film, uh, where <laughs> certainly better than uh Syrian Hins, who who just uh, I I just think he's dude. going like way too overboard with it in this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was not a fan of his performance. I felt, yeah, I felt, I just kind of felt, I was very neutral. Like, I'm not getting, like, sinister devil vibes from this guy. I'm just kind of getting, like, slightly unscrupulous businessman vibes. Like, you know. <laughs> Random <laughs> Eastern European it. villain. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, like. <laughs> I will say, like, uh, he, he, he's been on Hollow Victories before, Michael, can you even guess who he was before this? Ah, uh, I almost feel like you mentioned it when we were watching it. I did uh, not. Oh, that was Christopher Lambert. Um, that was Christopher Lambert. We'll get Lambert. to him. Uh, who did he play? John Carter's love interest's father. He is oh, the boy. king of helium in John Carter. <laughs> <laughs> you what a remember connection. that character at all? <laughs> yes. Like <laughs> I favorite, don't. He's like my favorite character. What's his name? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Tardas Moors. Oh boy. Bless you? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't remember him either. Speaking of characters from John Carter, Mark Strong is in this movie. I'd like to say that Idris Elba was actually okay in this. Like, he's clearly trying. He is the yes. most believable to me. But, but both, of, both of these movies have actors who have starred in your, your favorite franchises, Michael. Yes. We've got Bojack and Sanic. And Bojack. Correct. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, Idris, Idris Elba was definitely taking this the most seriously. It felt like he was actually putting some effort in. I believe you know? he was, yeah, he, I think that yeah, he... I, no. Nicolas Cage is definitely the most interesting actor in this film. He's the For actor sure. who commands the most attention in this film. Idris sure. Elba might be the best actor in this film. I'd agree. Yeah. No, yeah, that, I would agree with that as well. Uh, Johnny Whitworth plays the pretty much the main antagonist. Like apart from Satan, he he's like the henchman that does all the heavy lifting in this. I oh, think Kerrigan. he was trying, but I think he was really goofy, and I like it was not a good performance at all. It's fu if you gotta, we'll prop we'll get to this when we talk about Jonah Hex. But I feel like Kerrigan is a direct parallel to like the Burke character in Jonah Hex. Like, they both fulfill the same kind of role. Uh-huh. But I don't feel... I def, I don't feel... I feel like Kerrigan is more of, like, a comic-based antagonist, because I'm almost... I'm, I'm going to have to look it up, but I'm almost positive that the whole Kerrigan character was an actual Ghost Rider antagonist. But he's definitely not as entertaining as I think he could have been. They did some neat... I will admit they did some neat stuff with his power set, but... Like the whole decay thing, but that's beside the point. As it right. as the performance was just kind of, it was all right, you know. He was I, trying. I mean, it's it's kind of a cool power. Um, the only scene I would say really stands out to me is the one where he tries to eat a guy's sandwich and it just decays in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> the Twinkie um, doesn't decay. Yeah, I I think he's a little. Especially after he gets like the evil powers, he's he's a he's going a little too hard with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I agree. 
I wonder why they felt the need to make the connection between char- his character and um not Nadia the you know because I just it just seems like they keep bringing it up but it seems so irrelevant to the plot. It's really just so he can get away with saying some nasty stuff to her, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't really maybe there was like a ri- initially like a bigger plan with that and they just didn't go through with it. That's that is kind of weird now that you point out. Yeah, they like they, why did he have to have a history of her? They could have just made him a douchebag to her because he's a douchebag. Yeah, like yeah, that would have been the easier route. So, I don't know what what was going on there. Now we we did mention there there is an actor, another actor in this who has returned, uh, Mr. Christopher Lambert, uh, who who previously appeared in Southland Tales. He is in like none of this movie, <laughs> very little. Like he he he's one of the monks at like this monastery that's that like initially sends Idris Elba out to get. Johnny Blaze. Uh, he's pretty much in one scene, and then he gets killed by uh, Johnny Whitworth's character, and it's like, that's all you see of him. <laughs> what what a great use of Christopher Lambert. I, I, I like Christopher Lambert. I think Christopher Lambert's an entertaining actor. He does nothing in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it happens. <laughs> he's gonna be in... Stuff we talk about in the future, for sure. For sure. Will he dethrone our our current king? I don't know, but... I doubt it, but he, he definitely has the potential to come back a few times. Yeah. he's He's been in some shit. <laughs> um, do we have anything else to say about this i have no further comments on the cast of this film i yeah i'm good ready to move on to the next one if you guys are something something i think is worth mentioning with this film is it's one of only two movies to be released under the elusive marvel knights label (laughs) which was sort of after Disney acquired Marvel, there were, like, already some, like, standalone movies that were in development, and Marvel Knights is the label they came up with for, like, movies that weren't part of the MCU but were still Marvel movies. So it's it's this and Punisher, uh, Punisher War Journal. I can explain this a little bit. There is um there is a brand of comics it's called the Mar- that is the Marvel Knights. It is specifically a set of ground dark of darker ground level heroes. Usually down to the big the big four of this are Ghost Rider, Punisher, Moon Knight, and um it's on the tip of what was that? And Daredevil. That was on sorry, and Daredevil. So the Marvel Knights label usually encompasses them, occasionally a few others, but it was them. But that's where that comes from. Supposedly, there was a rumor that they were planning on making the all all of these characters connect at some point, kind of like a pre MCU crossover. But I, but I don't know if that's true. Uh now that Marvel is doing like multiverse stuff, I have heard rumors that Nick Cage's Ghost Rider is gonna come back. I don't know if those have been confirmed or not yet. That's just what I've heard. If that um, is true, I am so there for it. <laughs> I, I, he's a good casting choice. Both of the movies he's in were were not very good, but like, I'm totally down to see more Nick Cage as Ghost Rider. Yeah. I, no, I, I, I just want to see his very strange brand of Ghost Rider and them dare to try to contain it in the MCU. <laughs> I, I have to correct what I said just a second ago. The movie is called Punisher War Zone, not <laughs> Punisher War Journal. War Journal is a comic. Yes. It is very, very it is one of comic. It is one of the few comics I've read. I I, I like that one. Um Punisher War Zone is like 
kind of a good movie, but the villains, both of them, are just so fucking over the top. <laughs> they aren't even doing a New York accent. They're doing a New Yorker impersonating someone else doing a New York accent. <laughs> It's like a New Yorker going, oh, people from outside New York think we talk like, oh, yeah, I'm from New York. This is my New York accent. That is the exact voice the villains in this movie have. It's so, it's so painfully over the top. It, it, it kind of kills the movie. Very nice of the princess to invite us over. <laughs> sure was nice of the princess to make a picnic for us, gay Luigi. Uh, Mario! <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I think we need to recast the Super Mario Brothers movie, but with, <laughs> with Mackle and Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a redub. <laughs> well, all right, Matt, that's that's our project. Once that movie's out, we're going to redub the movie. Oh, <laughs> uh, which one of us is Mario and which one's Luigi? I you think didn't... I should be Luigi. I want to be Luigi. Okay. I mean, it goes against what we just did right there, but I'll fine. I'll be Mario. <laughs> Mushroom Kingdom, here we come. That's Beautiful. about it. That's about what Chris Pratt did. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. This is the penis. <laughs> <laughs> Luigi, what's that? <laughs> uh... <laughs> Why? <laughs> what else should we say about uh, Ghost Rider: Spirit of Vengeance? Uh, nothing. I nothing. I think we covered it. Uh, you know. <laughs> All right, uh, Olivia. Did you like this better or or less than the first Ghost Rider? Um, I think I I like the first Ghost Rider better. But I definitely will say I had a lot of fun with this one. I was, you know, there's just a lot here that was, there was a lot here to enjoy, especially from, from Nick Cage's performance. <laughs> yeah. I, it's very close, though. Yeah. If I just got I, one, I think it, it's very close. <laughs> I, I'm with Michael. I think this one's a mixed bag. I think it's like a bad script being made by good directors. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a fair assessment. All right, and uh, I guess that will bring us to our second film of this matchup. F almost 50 minutes in. Olivia, <laughs> tell us about Jonah Hex. So Jonah Hex is a, a 2010 movie based off of the DC character of the same name, Jonah Hex. This is set in the Old West, somewhat... A, they, I'm guessing somewhat after the Civil War. This follows a man named Jonah Hex, who, after betraying his fellow Confederates, was left to die after watching his wife and son be murdered. He was branded in the face and, it's a, and is now possessed with vengeance, trying to hunt down the man who'd killed his family and destroy, you know, destroyed everything he knew, General Turnbull. Years after becoming a bounty hunter, he finds out that Turnbull is alive and is apparently building a super weapon to destroy the United States of America. After it's a, he, Jonah Hex goes to pursue Turnbull and after being conscripted by the United States government, and it just becomes a race against time to stop Turnbull from building his super weapon. There's also a fun little supernatural twist where because Jonah almost died, he can apparently commune with the dead. So there is a slight supernatural element here. I, for some reason, was under the impression he had, like, satanic powers, which is part of why I paired these two up. Granted, I think the pair up still works. Oh, absolutely. I, I did think they both had satanic powers, and uh, there's no real suggestion that Jonah Hex's powers are satanic in origin, apart from his name being Hex. No, this is um. So from what I can tell you, like Jonah he Jonah Hex was is actually a very old con. Well, not as old. It's about the same age as Ghost Rider. So it's which both of them came out in the seventies. So this also was a this was still a good matchup. And yeah, they have very similar thing going on. Where yeah. but 
it's like, but yeah, it's, you know, it's still a good matchup. Yeah, I don't believe Jonah's, Jonah Hex's powers are satanic, but yeah, it's, you know, it's still a very bizarre set of circumstances, you know? There's, it's like, just from, I, I will admit, um, Jonah Hex is not one of the comic books I have a lot of expertise in. I actually, after, this movie did actually prompt me to go and like check some stuff. So again, like with Ghost Rider, someone did their homework, you know, where there are some refer- uh, some small references to the comics. They have a vague understanding of how Jonah Hex's stuff works, but there's still a lot of it gets kind of it's like I will say, though, between the two movies, this follows more of the by the numbers superhero movie stuff. You know, like all of those super early superhero movie tropes, uh, I would argue, which I, is weird. Yeah, for- yeah. I mean, I, I feel like this is more like, this is definitely more of a Western than a superhero movie. Well, that's true. It I, is. No, you're right. I mean, Jonah Hex uses pa- his powers like twice in this movie. <laughs> Am I wrong? Am I forgetting no. one? <laughs> No, you're no. You're um, correct. There's the first nope. one where he pulls his old friend out of the grave. No, no, that's the second one. No, there the was first the first du- one was the cage guy in a cage. Yeah, it was the dude in the cage. That might the be. De- that is it, isn't it? In fairness, something we said while we were watching Ghost Rider is that Ghost Rider is barely in it. They at least do yeah. a nice rule of three with Ghost Rider. You know, like one scene during Act One, one scene during Act Two, one scene during Act Three. I, so I think it's true. maybe a little more than that, but yeah, 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 you're you're about right. There's the scene where he loses his power as Ghost Rider, and then there's scenes where he's fighting Ghost Rider, but that's a base. Those are like the three big action scenes. Yeah. This is true. You, what are you guys thinking about this movie? I'm I'm very curious. Michael, I'll let you go first. Um, I appreciate a couple of things about it, like. It is, like, you know, very much like the movie we just talked about, Ghost Rider. It's not the worst shot movie. It's probably one of the better looking films we've covered cinematography wise, but not by a wide margin. You know, like movies like Barbed Wire, that was also a movie that had decent sets and was shot fairly well, you know, but it doesn't mean that only takes you so far. I do agree with Olivia. I don't know if Olivia even said that about this movie yet, but some of the effects in this movie, like, were okay like there was some where they're showing the bodies like deform and it, it looked decent um, yeah I, we, yeah yeah but it's like man this one really lost me again dialogue is really bad except in this one i'd say it's actually worse than ghost rider because the like there's exposition in ghost rider but this movie is obnoxious about it it'll have like information revealed and then uh josh brolin will repeat that information that you just learned in a voiceover um and i also just yeah, like there's not a single that. character in this movie that i had any form of investment with like in ghost rider at least you have idris elba elba given like again a decent performance and nicholas cage's over the top performance that made him really entertaining in this movie oh man will will arnett's trying his we'll talk about casting will arnett i think is trying his heart out but it's just he's not he's a type he's great at playing a specific type of character but you can't he really struggles when he tries to branch out i feel um, Josh Brolin, I don't even blame him. His dialogue was fucking terrible. Um, John Malkovich. So corny. <laughs> I thought John Malkovich fucking, I'm sorry. I was so mean. I thought John Malkovich fucking sucked. I like him in certain things. I thought he was so bad in this. Like this was he one of the worst is, performances uh, I've ever seen. It's so phoned in. <laughs> and <Yeah>. I was like. <laughs> it's so, f- I think that's just the problem is it feels like almost everybody is checked out. Like no one's, yeah. no one's taking this seriously. Yeah, no. no one's trying. It's just like, you know. And maybe like, maybe I would be commenting more on like Megan Fox if I expected anything else from her. But Megan Fox doesn't have that one role where she's wowed me. Joss Brolin, great as Thanos. John Malkovich, great as John Malkovich. <laughs> I... Here's the thing, like, I I definitely feel the Neville Dean and Taylor influence on this movie, but Mm -hmm. honestly, like, the first time I was watching this, I was like, 
This needed someone who could really commit to the weirdness. Like Neville Dean and Taylor. Neville Dean and Taylor could direct this film well. And then I looked it up and I'm like, oh shit, they wrote the movie. <laughs> and it's like... It, it almost feels like it was written for them to direct it. And then they didn't direct it. And it's like... Yeah, whoever's fucking directing this, uh, it's, I'll, I'll pull up the guy's name, but, like, he cannot do a fucking Neville Dean and Taylor movie. No. He no, I no Neville Dean and Taylor. Jimmy Hayward, <laughs> who, who's, whose filmography outside of this film is Horton Hears a Who and <laughs> Free Birds. That's it. Those are the three movies he's directed. This... Horton Hears a Who, and Freebirds. We're going back in time to the first Thanksgiving to get turkey off the menu. That's <laughs> right. We're going back to the first Thanksgiving to get turkey off the menu. <laughs> this is, that was such a weird filmography right there. <laughs> I don't even, I don't, what do you say after that? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> You say Neville Dean and Taylor should have directed this. No, absolutely. Um, because when I was, because this took me down a bit of a rabbit hole after we watched Jonah Hex. I was looking shit up and I was like, wow, Jonah Hex's comic is batshit crazy. You know, <laughs> it's, it is. There's all kinds of supernatural bullshit. There's people getting pulled in and out of time. There's, you know, there's demons there's all kinds of nonsense and it just would have worked if they if someone like neville dean and taylor had been directing it and just embraced the madness but it's like you know and it's one of those things if i can't even i don't even know if they would have been able to pull it off but at least i think they would have had more fun it movie would have felt more fun kind of like ghost rider too and i just kind of i can't help but feel like there's i feel like under here really Really deep down, there's a decent movie trying to be made, but it's just no one gives enough of a shit to make it happen, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I, I really do think you see that with the performances because I just. I get. It really does feel like they're phoning it in. I think Will Arnett is the one who's trying the hardest, and that says a lot. That says a lot. I've got to get. I've, it's. For me, it's really hard to tell. I feel like if you just intersplice footage of Megan Fox in each movie she's in, it's going to be about the same level of energy. Okay, hold right. on. But it's a, maybe I, I'm being too rough, but like too harsh. But if if we're getting into like the cast and the acting already, maybe we yeah we better just commit to it. I guess. <laughs> yeah, Megan Fox is barely in this movie. She True. is in. Two scenes before the climax, and then the whole climax is like, Ooh, Jonah Hex, you better come, we're gonna kill her. And it's like, we've seen two scenes with this character. I don't know who this is. I th she she doesn't she doesn't even get like the ending with Jonah Hex. At the end, he's like, Aw, oh, dog, dog who was in like two scenes. Oh, you and me, we're pals now. I forgot about yep. the fucking dog. Yeah, that was so weird. <laughs> there was no build like build up to that at all. The dog he calls the dog handsome and then the dog joins his team but also doesn't really show up much after joining his team. Like yeah, like we get a scene that proves the dog can be useful. The dog can help, but then the dog doesn't proceed to do anything. Yeah. It's it, one of those things if I kind of but Josh Brolin, the dog, have more chemistry than he does with Megan Fox. Absolutely. <laughs> right. I mean, most people have more chemistry with a dog than Megan Fox, but... <laughs> Absolutely. I, that was mean. I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, uh, this this is like uh, pre the, the Michael Bay Ninja Turtles, you know, Will Arnett and, and oh, yeah. uh, Megan Fox teaming up. Oh, they could both be in another Hollow Victories episode with that in mind. Yeah. God. I, <laughs> I could I could do the second Michael Bay Ninja Turtles versus like TMNT three Turtles in Time. I think Turtles in Time would win hands down, but it would be a fun episode. 
Oh, for yeah. sure. Something to think about, guys. <laughs> Will Arnett is an actor who has my respect for BoJack and Job. And it's not like there's no one else other than BoJack and Job, you know? I mean, Lego Batman's pretty fun. He had yeah, I was going to this... say, he's, he's my favorite Batman. <laughs> he's... No, yeah, he is among one of the best, you know? And I say that unironically. He had this Netflix show that was kind of like BoJack, where he was playing a depressed main character, and I really hated the way that show was written. I wanted to like it. I try. I watched like four episodes, and they were pretty lengthy episodes too. I was trying really hard to like it, but I just didn't. But I thought his performance was good. I thought like because he was casted as the right type of character. I don't think he has a lot of range, but I also have to say, who else is gonna play BoJack and Job? Nobody. Like he is perfect for those characters. He he, in my opinion, is the only one who could do them. So while I don't think he has a lot of range, if you give him the right part, he is the perfect person for the job. Uh, uh, l- let us not forget his greatest contribution to filmmaking: the nut job too nutty by nature. <laughs> yeah, right up there, a free bird as like a cinema masterpiece. I actually. Something I love him in that like is is kind of minor. He's he's the narrator in the trailer for Edgar Wright's Don't, <laughs> the the fake trailer he made for for the Grindhouse triple feature. You know what? He plays the douchey boyfriend in Hot Rod, and I think Hot Rod's a really good comedy. It's like a completely like nonsensical movie. Like there's nothing to take even remotely seriously in that movie. It's just stupid. But I. <laughs> Me and my friends quote that movie still, like, and some of those quotes come from him. He's really funny in the movie. But again, he's playing a douchebag. Like, he's really good at playing a douchebag. But, like, a funny douchebag, not an annoying douchebag. Job is a douchebag. He's really funny. Bojack is a douchebag. He's funny, but also, like, this really deep character. You know who I'm just finding out Will Arnett played? Who? Who? The guy from Ratatouille who killed a guy with his thumb. That's him? Yeah, that's Will Arnett. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I uh, I have to watch Ratatouille again. <laughs> he's the yeah. If you when you see it again, he's the sous chef who has the mysterious backstory. Yeah, that's funny. That uh, is so funny. I love Will Arnett. I do think he. I think he's a typecasted actor, but I mean, I don't think that there's any shame in that if you're like really good at what you're typecasted as, and he's fucking great at it. This movie, no, he was not very good in this. I think he was trying though. I could, I could hear it in his voice. He was trying to change his voice. He was trying not to sound like Will Arnett. Um, okay, I, okay, get re- remind me. Get, I do because I know his voice. I cannot remember his face for the life of me. I've been sitting here for this whole conversation trying to remember what he looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Which guy is he playing? In, in, he doesn't uh, even do he much in the hex. movie. Yeah, no, he's like Ulysses S. Grant, main guy who like oh. is is in charge of recruiting. Uh, the guy with the little mustache, who's like a kind of a dick to Jonah Hex when he shows up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I thought that's who he was, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. <laughs> we spent a long time on Will Arnett. Uh, I've got the shirt on. We have to. Uh, Josh Brolin as Mister Jonah Hex. I like Josh Brolin. I don't think yeah. he's very good in this movie. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, I. It's like it's one of those things of like. To be fair, they're not giving him a lot to work with. He's just yeah. stoic cowboy, you know. I. It's yeah. not even that they're not giving him a lot to work with. It's that what they're giving him to work with is not good. That well, no, yeah, that's probably more accurate. <gasps> it's the exposition thing I was talking about before he. <laughs> He's just a character there that's there to introduce himself to every character he walks past. Hi, I'm Jonah Hex. Let me tell yeah. you my story. <laughs> We're going to have to, at some point, re-watch this movie and either count or make a drinking game out of how many times people, when he walks up to somebody, they go, oh, Hex, you know, like someone says his name. <laughs> like they have to keep reminding us that this is the guy, you know. 
I just want there to be a character on screen every single time he's monologue and they're giving an exposition. It's like, oh, you're paying attention, right? This this is very important for the story. Just like, <laughs> he's like on a completely different layer. He's not even in the scene, actually in the scene. He's just covering the screen up. Bonus points for the reused flashback of his family getting murdered. <laughs> they got a lot of mileage out of that one. They did. They did. John Malkovich, I already oh. said he was bad. Do you guys have an opinion on him? No, yeah, that it was no. not. It was definitely not I, the best John Malkovich. I said everything I have to say about John Malkovich in our Aragon episode. I he he has been good in stuff. Yes. He is not a good actor. <laughs> generally, generally absent of good direction, he is not a good actor. Michael Fassbender plays like the the head henchman in this movie. Uh, kind of doing, like, an Irish accent. And weirdly, like, he's in the movie Hunger, where he plays an Irishman. He's, like, an, an IRA member in Hunger. And he's really good in that. In this movie, I do not buy his Irish accent at all. He's also just forgettable. I don't remember a thing about him in this. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I thought it's like, he seemed he was trying i give him a little more like he's the i gave him i'm giving him more credit than kerrigan in uh ghost rider spirit of vengeance he's still not great but at least it kind of feels like he's having fun with it i think it like you know he out of everybody else in this movie it feels like he's also trying to give somewhat of a crap you know Mm mm-hmm but it's just, he's not trying as hard as Will Arnett. He's trying slightly harder than, like, everybody else, but it's not enough still. Yeah. That's what, that's what I took away from it. I don't know. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. Um, weirdly, we, we have uh, Wes Bentley, who was in the first Ghost Rider, but not Spirit of Vengeance. <laughs> oh, um, weird. I did not really like him in the first Ghost Rider, and I really did not like him in this movie. He's he's the guy who, like, helps out uh, John Malkovich, but then John Malkovich is like, Nope, I gotta kill you just to prove that I'm super evil. Yeah! Yeah, he's like, he's not even in the movie enough, I would even argue, to mention. He's just kind of you're there. He's okay. Lance Reddick plays the same character he plays in John Wick. He's fine at it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, the, yeah, it's basically the same character he plays in John Wick. Just Car- like the guy who who gives John who gives Jonah Hex, who gives Jonah Wick uh, all the weapons. He um, also like. He also, like, has kind of a normal job now, although I guess in John Wick he doesn't really have a normal job, because, like, the hotel that he was working at is kind of a weird one. But, like, you know, he has, like, a job. He hasn't seen the main character in a long time, and when he sees the main character again, he's very casual about it. Like, it's hitting all of the same beats that the character in John Wick hits. Can I just see that bo- that scene? It's, like, not that scene in particular, but the aftermath of that scene bothers me because he went and made... Jonah Hex went and made that special trip to go see him and get the weird little crossbow dynamite guns, and then he just ditches them <laughs> in that scene. And I'm like, why he, did we do this? He, he does ditch them very quickly. Um, and I'm like, you just ditched your dynamite crossbow guns. You're not getting another one of those. Go back. Go get it. You know, that's going to be handy, but no. You know. The the one thing I would say distinguishes him from his John Wick character is that, like, this is right after the Civil War, and they, they're going to celebrate, like, the American Centennial, and he's like, yes, I'm going to celebrate with a bunch of other free men. So he he does have that, like, emancipated black man thing going on uh, that he did not have in Shono, in in John Wick. (laughs) But, uh... No, John Wick also took place right after the Civil War. Yeah, famously. (laughs) Um, They they don't mention it because the guns are, like, so high-tech, but uh, it, it, it is supposed to have taken place... In like the late eighteen hundreds. Yeah, it's a sci-fi. Yeah, some there's some wild Jules Verne, Verne shit happened, you know. 
Yeah. I... Something I did want to bring up... I don't know. Maybe, maybe we have more cast to talk about. We do have Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who I consider, like, a pretty good actor in there, as well as Michael Shannon, who I think is, like, one of my, like, top underrated actors. He, he does not get enough credit. I love Michael Shannon. I don't have a ton to say about anyone else in the cast, but I think it's worth, like, the little shout-out for sure. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to bring up uh, is, is actually, it's Jeffrey Dean Morgan's character, Jeb. Uh, he He's talking to Jonah Hex and talk, talking about, like, Jonah versus uh, uh, Turnbull, um, John Malkovich's character. And he's like, I I'm seeing less and less difference between you two. You you two are the same in my eye. You're just as bad as him. And I'm like, my dude, one of these characters is trying to restart the Confederacy. Uh, I kind of think Jonah Hex is better than that. <laughs> <laughs> like, he may, he may not be like a great person, but he's not trying to bring back the Confederacy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's not. Yeah, he's not trying to blow up the entire United States Capitol with a giant death machine. <laughs> levels of angry here. This is Jonah Hex is working with. Oh man, I watched my I watched my wife and kid die. Anger. This man is working with burn everything down. And, you know, and start over. Anger. There's a big difference he right there. He would have totally raided the Capitol in modern day. Oh yeah, no, hands down, easily. <laughs> it's it's funny to me that they they go out of their way to be like, oh Jonah Hex, you never believed in the Confederacy or slavery. You just yeah. you you fought on our side because you didn't like the government telling you what to do. No, they uh yeah, I was thinking about that. I think. There's like, you know, I think that's why we have the whole season, the whole thing with the dog. Like they needed to like do little things to prove that Jonah Hex wasn't a like, wasn't a bad guy, you know. <laughs> damage control. Yeah, they had little, little damage control things like, you know. And, 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 so yeah, they, 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 that was kind of funny to me because I was like, yeah, they really, uh, when they said that he fought for the Confederacy, they really had to do some damage control there because that... <laughs> Everybody been been like, ooh, wait, why are we rooting for this dude? You know? Yeah. I, I've i got something I'd like to say about this movie, but it has nothing to do with casting. Is there anything else that you guys need to say first? Not at all. Uh, Go on. I'm good. Doing a big action movie, especially with like a character that has the powers that he has, uh, doing nothing but suggested violence is pretty fucking lame. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, this is... This is where, I mean, for one thing, I'm sure it was the studio who insisted on a PG-13 rating. Yeah. But on top of that, it's it's the place where, like, Neville Dean and Taylor's writing and this other random dude's directing start to deviate. Because Neville Dean and Taylor would have just shown that shit. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. They're also, like, teasing you with it at first. Like, oh, this is going to be a really gory shot, and then... No, it just cuts away, and I, 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 you don't have to have super gory shots in an action movie. You can do it without that, but it's just like when you kind of hit at it and then cut away, you just come off like a coward, no matter what. Yeah, no, yeah. I was gonna say this was. There are some movies like that just need to hit, especially comic book movies. There's just some that need to be rated R, and I think yeah. Jonah Hex. I mean, here's the only thing. I am only glad Jonah Hex is not rated R because then you know like hell they would have extended the it's like the scene with uh fucking Megan Fox and Josh Brolin and I didn't need to see that. But, <laughs> you know. But it's like if they only used the rated R for the violence then I would have been like, okay, you know. <laughs> I I think this movie would have been better if it was rated R. I will agree that I maybe so. that scene would have been lesser. Because I even, like, like fucking Logan, an R-rated superhero movie I really enjoy, 
Uh, I think they they went a little excessive with the nudity. They're just like, ha, here's some random nudity for you because it's an R-rated movie. Right. Like, Ghost Rider was also PG-13, but it never at any point felt like it was shying away from doing something it wanted to do, you know? Where this movie, it felt yeah. like it was doing that constantly. Yeah, yeah because... This yeah, feels like, like Ghost- it was... It was written as an R-rated movie, and then it was sort of forced into the PG-13 box. Yeah, I think we... It's like, it's one of those things that I think we really... It's really hard to avoid, because like just like a lot of the situations and like a lot of the imagery, it's just going, okay, it's just like a few, few little steps more, and we're going to be in our rating, and it just wouldn't commit to it. At least like with Ghost Rider... When they did the violence, a lot of things like are just turning into ash and exploding and getting set on fire. You know, it's at least cool, you know, it's visually interesting. But Jonah Hex, there's like a lot of times where, yeah, they go to do something cool, but they just, you know, but it just gets cut short, you know? For sure. Yeah. It's, there's like a couple times where it's almost funny, but then it's like, okay, come on, you know? (laughs) Uh, weirdly, the, this film has, like, some crossover with the movie The Losers, which is also a comic book movie, and that's one that was, like, written to be R-rated and infamously was cut down to a PG-13. And it, 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 it's, it's weird that, like, a couple of the actors, well, I mean, Idris Elba was in that, but uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan was in that, and, and and like a lot of like the lesser cast members in this film were also in that film. So it feels How like there's funny. a lot of overlap between the two, but also like both of them were like forced into this PG-13 box, much to the detriment of the film. <laughs> no, yeah, look, trust me, guys, I could go on about like superheroes are ratings comic book movies and that kind of like stuff all day that's like a whole nother discussion <laughs> but yeah up. no i def yeah no i def but i definitely think that yeah there's i think jonah hex i don't know like i said i think there's a good movie somewhere in there but it's really deep down i don't know if an r very rating would have helped but it couldn't yeah very deep but it couldn't have hurt at this point you know right right yeah, no, Jonah Hex is far from the worst thing we've covered on this show. It's got some positive qualities to it. It's definitely on the higher side of the list than the lower side, but it's, at the end of the day, I think it's a lame movie. I, yeah, no. Here's the thing, like, there's kind of, like, a lot of hate for this movie online, and I, I think that's maybe unwarranted, like... I don't think it's good, but, like, its biggest crime is just that it's kind of lame. Like, there's yeah. stuff that works about it. It is not devoid of good qualities, but mostly it's just kind of lame. You know what? Yeah, it- like, this... No, I was just going to say, like, yeah, when you guys told me, like, how low it scored on Rotten Tomatoes, I do not believe this is 12% on Rotten Tomatoes bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, But I don't think it's, like, I'm not going to say this is a good movie necessarily, but it definitely did not, de- does not deserve as much hate as 12% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, right. I, maybe, maybe we should take a moment to reflect on, like, the positive qualities of this movie. I think some of the action does work. Yeah. There's that. Yeah. I also think the soundtrack is fucking killer. <laughs> like, the no, soundtrack yeah. is way better than this movie deserved. And and Absolutely. after we were done watching it, y- you, Olivia, I believe, said, like, oh, yeah, Mastodon did the, s- the soundtrack. And I'm like, yeah, I that explains yeah. a lot. That explains a lot that Mastodon did this soundtrack, because this is such a kick-ass soundtrack. No, yeah, (laughs) honestly, the soundtrack goes way harder than this movie deserves. (laughs) Yeah, no, if, listen, if Neville Dean and Taylor directed this, that would be completely appropriate. For the lame mess that it turned out to be, nah, not so much. 
Do you think if we swapped uh, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance's soundtrack with the Jonah Hex soundtrack, you think that would help both movies? Or what do you think would happen? Uh, it would definitely hurt Jonah Hex. It might well, yeah. help Ghost Rider. I, I was thinking, like, what if we swapped directors here? I feel like if Neville Dean and Taylor wrote and directed this one, it would be, like way better where if like someone other than Neville Dean and Taylor were directing Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance it'd be way worse yeah no that's a good point no that, no one wins like, yeah like like their involvement is what has made this connection it's what has made this matchup but I feel like their involvement is like one of the better parts of both movies <laughs> Honestly, guys, this is what this is what Hollow Victories was all is all about. This matchup right here, <laughs> just the whole the whole thesis of your show. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, no, there's a reason the title of this film is Hollow Victories. <laughs> of the, of this show is Hollow Victories. Uh, um. Oh my God. Anything else or? I yeah, have have we made it to the part where we have to declare a hollow victor? I, I think ready. so. I don't know if I am. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia, you're the guest, so you get first vote. Okay. Um, I'm gonna be honest. This one is this one was this one's kind of it's actually not as no. You know what? I'm not even gonna play around. This it, I think Ghost Riders. I think Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance is the slightly better movie because even though like I got to even though I think a little there's a little more quality in the shots and stuff for and like of course the soundtrack is incredible for Jonah Hex honestly Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance is just way more fun it's way more you know it's way more enjoyable and I kind of feel like in a weird very twisted way well, they're about equal in as far as how faithful they are to the comics, which is not very much, but I'm just going to go ahead and go, I say Ghost Rider Spirits of Vengeance is the more enjoyable film. I I, I agree. I think it's, I one, I just enjoyed it more personally, but there have been instances where what I declared as the winner and what I liked more was not the same thing. In this case, I think it's like for both. Like I enjoyed this one more and I think... I don't know, like, I look at the shots in Ghost Rider, and it's like, a lot of them do just feel like two people trying to have as much fun making the movie as possible. Like, one thing we've neglected to mention during the Ghost Rider segment was the one shot where they jump off a cliff, like, just how much fucking effort they were putting into some of these shots. Yeah, no. That's, that's like, a famous behind-the-scenes clip for this movie, is that, like, they took this IMAX 3D camera and dangled it over a cliff just to get a shot of, like... Idris Elba falling off the edge of a cliff. Yeah, and in terms of, like, the characters, I think the characters in Jonah Hex are so fucking forgettable. Like, the... Mo most of them, we just saw, watched it, like, two days ago, and a lot of the cast members, I can't even tell you who they were, because I already forget. The only ones that I'm able to, like, recall either were major parts, or it's because I recognize the actor from something else I enjoy. Um... Where Ghost Rider, Nick Cage is entertaining, Idris Elba does a decent job, like, and no one else is very good in that movie. It's not like that movie has a significant, I think most of the acting in that movie is on par with Jonah Hex, but it has those two people that I think elevates it. I don't know, I think Ghost Rider is better than Jonah Hex in a lot of ways. Uh, I'll give you guys the soundtrack, that's something that Jonah Hex wins in, but that's one category out of many. I think Ghost Rider is, like, actually a decent bit better than Jonah Hex. Okay, uh, this is, this is maybe unorthodox. I'm really only doing this because I'm the last one to vote, but, uh, I'm gonna vote for Jonah Hex purely on the basis that I don't think Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance deserves to win hands down. I don't think it deserves to win unanimously, <laughs> I think there are things Jonah Hex does better and that Jonah Hex deserves credit for. Ultimately, in my mind, these two films are pretty equal, but uh, you two guys are both voting for, for Spirit of Vengeance, and 
I'm looking at I'm looking at the poll here. The audience is with you guys. It's 82% Spirit of Vengeance versus 18% for Jonah Hex. And so in that case, I am voting for Jonah Hex purely on the basis that I think Jonah Hex deserves a little recognition. I don't think Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance deserves, like, the unanimous win. I think these are very close in terms of quality. Uh, I think under different circumstances, you might be able to get me to vote for Spirit of Vengeance, but I'm voting Jonah Hex purely so it does not... So, so, <laughs> so it's not unanimous for Spirit of Vengeance. I've got no problem it, with that. Yeah, I have no problem with that either. And if I'm going to be honest, you, if, you know, you could persuade, I could be persuaded to vote for Jonah Hex, you know, because yeah, you are yeah. correct. They're very equal in a lot of ways. You know, I just, in, I'm just going from the mindset of like the excessive effort on Nick Cage's part and then Idris Elba's part compared to the rest of the entire cast of Jonah Hex is what makes yeah. me go, okay, yeah, I'm voting for this way. But yeah, I also do no, agree I, with you, Jonah Hex. I, I totally, I totally understand why anyone would vote for, for Ghost Rider here. And I respect that it has won. Uh, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance wins. I, I, I think that is totally fair. I just, I think it's way too close for me to want to be like, oh, it's unanimous. Uh. That's also understandable. Honest to no. God, it's not, I, I don't say this to be like rude or condescending. It's honestly not that close for me. <laughs> like I've got, uh, looking at my list, I've got uh, Ghost Rider at number nine and I have uh, this one at number 20. I got Jonah Hex at 24. <laughs> like I actually really? enjoy Ghost Rider a good bit more, but I, I hear where you guys are coming from for sure. No, yeah, like Completely I, it's like, honestly, I, like... I have Ghost Rider at 19. I have Jonah Hex at 20. Uh. <laughs> okay that's fair you know honestly yeah. i'm gonna go ahead also go ahead and say i've you know i've seen a lot of comic book movies and i'm gonna admit i enjoy jonah hex a fair like a fair bit more than i thought and yeah i definitely stand by it doesn't deserve a 12 percent on rotten tomatoes it's not as that. horrible as people make it sound but honestly i'm you know but if they ever like oh yeah we're gonna come back to this property make a new jonah hex movie i'm gonna be like okay fine good do it do it you know do <laughs> i don't want this to be its lasting legacy <laughs> yeah i don't want this movie to be its only film legacy <laughs> but it's like yeah but i yeah i definitely can i can see where either yeah then again that's just the nature of this show it's a it's a hollow victory <laughs> <laughs> it, it sure is it sure is uh, Cat in the Hat is one of the better movies that we've talked about on the show. <laughs> it you know, I've is. never actually seen that. <laughs> <laughs> never seen Cat in the Hat, man. I I That's... have refused to watch the live action um Dr. Seuss films. No, no, we agreed <laughs> those two were like among the better movies we have done for this show. Okay, so next time on Hollow Victories, we are doing two ripoff movies, but this time they are ripoffs of the same movie. That movie being Steven Spielberg's E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Next time, it is The Pod People versus Mac and Me. You, you you fucked me out of my April request yet again, Matt. Maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> I maybe if April like starts on the first some year, uh, if on on a Tuesday, if the first is on a Tuesday, <laughs> we'll 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 do your April suggestion. <laughs> It's a great one. It's a great pick. <laughs> um, yeah, let me look at the calendar for many years from now. To two ET, it's, I think it's gonna be like three yeah, or four years. Yeah, it's Wednesday years. next year too. Two ET ripoffs. Have you seen ET? You know, not the whole way through. <laughs> I was asking. I Michael. got freaked. <laughs> 
because oh, he is. Oh, I'm sorry. He, he's the one that's going to be in that episode. Fair enough. I was like, oh, what an odd question. <laughs> um, I saw it a long time ago. I would want to watch it again. Okay. By the way, if uh, we're still doing this show in 2029, we will land on a Tuesday. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I I I, sh- I definitely should rewatch it. I definitely should rewatch it, and maybe we'll do a yeah. I'm I'm, I'm down know. to do an out of the ring about it because uh, coming very soon, possibly it's even out by the time we put this episode out. Uh, we're gonna do uh, Hollow Victories out of the ring about the Crank duology, since that is Neville Dean and Taylor's most uh, uh well respected cinematic output uh-huh. and so maybe there will also be an episode on et before we do the pod people versus mac and me episode yes anyways um olivia is there anything you would like to plug Yes, please. I would like to plug our channel, Smash Pack. Um, it's on over there. <laughs> over there, I do a show about comics. I do a couple of them. I'm, I'm it's like, and then so come, please say hi. Come check it out. Uh, I'm hopefully, let's see. I don't know when this is coming out, but hopefully, I should have a video about Static, the original Static comics, coming out very soon. Hopefully, it'll already be there. So please come check us check that out at Smash Pack. Uh, this is going to be out March 7th, I believe. Then it definitely should be out, I hope. So, I hope they'll come I hope they'll come watch it anyway. All right. Yeah, there's uh the a link to that channel should be in the end card also in the description if you want to go check out Smash Pack. That also has our friend Chris who was in the uh uh joysticks versus the wizard episode. Um, Hell yeah. Either of you have anything else to say before we end this one? No. Right on. I'm about to pass out. Alrighty. In that case, for my co-host, Mackle Shadak. Should I call you Spiny Norman now? That is like... You're getting big over on on the Spiny Norman channel. Let's let's go for Mackle. Let's stick to Mackle for now. (laughs) All right, for my co-host, Mac Oshidakel, I'm Matt Presents. We will see you in the next one. Thank you for joining us. Peace.